um, what is a jack? So jacks are of the family Corangidae. They have those deeply forked tails. Um, their second dorsal fin and their anal fins are somewhat symmetrical. They look kind of similar shape, the second dorsal fin and the anal fin. Um, they're often, the different jacks are identified with different spots, uh, the location of the water line, the shape of the head. But there's actually, there's, there's 96 different species of jacks. And I'm gonna, before I get to the, the Trevally, the Karenix jacks, I wanna break down just the different, the other different genuses of jacks. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is tomrollandpodcast.com and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRolandPodcast.com. And the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram. Or you can go to our big account, Saltwater underscore Experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now, let's get on to today's show. Mike Larkin, you're back for another podcast. We've had two awesome podcasts about tarpon and bonefish, and today we're going to talk about, uh, in my opinion, the most underrated game fish in North America, the Jack Crevel and the whole Jack family. What uh, You've done a lot of research on, on jacks as well as the bonefish and the tarpon. People loved our podcast with the, with the tarpon and the bonefish. Um, what are we going to talk about with jacks today, Mike? Yeah, I was going to start with Jax and then move into Trevally. So I thought I could start, and I always start with the geological record, but it's really not that interesting for Jax. So they arrived in the tertiary period, which is about 65 to 1.6 million years ago. But they weren't around with the dinosaurs or anything like that, like the tarpon ancestors mm-hmm. were. So the, that's really not that, that interesting. So more I'd like to focus on just um, what is a Jack? So Jax are of the family... Corangidae. They have those deeply forked tails. Um, their second dorsal fin and their anal fins are somewhat symmetrical. They look kind of similar shape, that second dorsal fin and the anal fin. Um, they're often, uh, the different jacks are identified with different spots, uh, the location of the water line, the shape of the head. But there's actually, there's, there's 96 different species of jacks. And I'm mm. going to, before I get to the, the Trevally, the Karenix jacks, I want to break down just a different the other different genuses of jacks. There's the um, the Seriola jacks, which are amber jacks, you know, the lesser amber jack, greater amber jack. Uh, Agladis jacks, which is like the rainbow runners. That's in our genus mm-hmm. of jacks. Uh, Trachinotis jacks. You should know that one, Tom. Do you know what a Trachinotis That's, jack uh, is? That's uh, the Trevally? Uh, no, Trachinotis is permanent and pompadour. Oh, right. Trachinotis so. <laughs> fal- ca- falcati, right? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just putting you on the spot there. Yeah, oh, you, you got me. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. wasn't expecting it, but uh, now that you say it, yes, I I do know that. Well, I don't I think you guys talk about the genus of species on the boat. Maybe you do, but I maybe I, I guess you don't. Well, it's but, always um, good for like some kind of uh, <laughs> under the radar boat name or something like Trachinotis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's the name of the boat or something. You know. Yeah, um, yeah. If you get clever. Yeah, yeah. Yes. But um, Electus jacks. Those are the African pompano. That's mm-hmm. another species of jack. Uh, the Celine jacks, which are look downs. That's another species of jack. Uh, the capturous jacks, which are also um, scad, goggle eye, cigar, I know those popular bait mm. jacks, you know, for sailfish. Um, but then to get into, so, and then I want to get into the, the Karnix jacks. 
But before I get into that, there's another interesting um, way to uh, distinguish, uh, to identify jacks. They have these two spines um, in front of the renal fin. And I was going to share my screen real quick because I think it's interesting. When I first heard about this, I was like, what? What spines are you talking about? So here, I'm going to share my screen real quick. And this is something show you that all jacks will have? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. But it's really hard to see. So here, oh, I think I this is like a lesser amberjack. Uh -huh. And then my next slide, I'll actually – Zoom in a little. You see it there yes. in that, that red there? So anyway, it's just something when I first heard about that, I'm like, what? They have it. I actually, I've checked it on permit. Permit have it as well. And all the jack species will have these tiny little, huh. tiny little spines there. We were debating but, um, about a rainbow runner being, being a jack on our last uh, shoot. The rainbow runners oh, where right now Which on, it is. on the reef are just, they're, they're just chewing up everything out there. I've never seen so many rainbow runners. But um, we were debating about that because I had never heard them being referred to in the Jack family. But had I known that little trick of looking for the, the two spines right there, I could have yeah, I could have yeah, known. Yeah, yeah def definitely rainbow runner species of Jacks. There's 96 total species of Jack. But I guess what I want to get into is the, um, the, the genus of Karanix. Jacks. So this is their, um, uh, these are what uh, the Trevally. Um, there's 18 species of them. They have a deep body and, and long pectoral fins. They have those scoots, mm -hmm. um, you know, like those, it's essentially a hardened scale. Yes. But you know, in fact, yeah, if you want to get, I could, let me, I should just keep sharing it here. My, share my screen again here. But the, um, I'm showing you an example of um, some, some of the, the Karenix jacks. So here's a, a Jack Creval here. And you can see it's got those like those scoots. Yes. Right there. You gotta be super careful of those, so. especially when they get bigger. Those things will get you. Yeah. So 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 really, what I want to make the argument is, I I mean, you, it's funny. Like you, you probably have more experience than I do, but like I watch a lot of these fishing shows, and they're over in the Pacific, like Travali, Travali, you know, Travali. Yes. What I what I think is funny is that people don't realize we have Travali right here in in Florida. You know, there there's the, the there's actually five different species of Trevally right over here in Florida. So the Jack Creval is, is one of them. Trevally is basically a Jack of the genus Karanix. And here, like Jack Creval is one of them. Um, Blue Runner are also one of them. Mm -hmm. That's another one. I have my own list here. So they have a um, Jack Creval, Black Jack, and I'll show you some pictures in a second, but Jack Creval, Black Jack, Horse Eye Jack is also mm -hmm. a, a Karanix Jack. Yellow Jack. There's some recent debate about current moving Yellow Jack out of the um, the Karanix to a different one, but for now it's listed as a Karanix Jack, the Yellow Jack, which you get on the reefs. Mm -hmm. and pretty much all of these you get the reef and Blue Runner. And what I mean is, so they have those, you know, again to highlight these scoots here, that long pectoral fin there, and then just to show you this next picture. So here's a Black Jack. I've only, they're in hmm. Florida. I've only seen them personally in the Dry Tortugas. Wow. But it's funny if you look at the Black Jack we have here in Florida. And then you look at the bluefin trevally, they're really similar. I mean, a, a different color, but they're very similar. But yet, you know, you go to the Pacific and everyone thinks trevally gets so much respect as a sport fish. But then you come over to the Atlantic and Jack's like, eh, I caught Jack. Yeah. You know, but they're, no, it's, they're it, also trevally. <laughs> it is absolutely like that. And I've I've wondered that myself because, you know, they're – there is a big difference between um, a Jack Crevel and a giant Trevally, and mostly in the size. Now, our Jack yeah. Crevel get yeah. really big, but the but the giant Trevally get much much bigger. I mean, they, in they fact, get I look, really big. Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, I looked up I looked up the size of that. Um, the IGFA I just went by the I think 2021 IGFA records, and uh -huh. yeah. The, the biggest weight for giant Trevally is uh, the record is 160 pounds. Yeah. And the biggest weight for a Jack Creval is 66 pounds. So, I mean, it's essentially 100 pounds bigger, yeah. right? The, the giant Trevally, it, 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 it deserves that name, right? Giant Trevally. It is, it is a big, big, big Trevally. Yeah, they right? are. But, but, but the difference in the, in the respect that the fish are getting is, is, significant if you go to christmas island i've been to christmas island in australia uh where those fish are um and if you catch a a, a bluefin trevally that is the size of a blue runner it's celebrated and <laughs> <laughs> you know you're out there with a with a 10 weight rod or whatever and here comes this this small 
uh, trevally, but a trevally is a trevally in their eyes, and and it is a great fish. And if you caught, you know, fifty bonefish, they would be happier about a trevally. And it's like, okay, well, the Jack Crevel, we could catch fifty of these, way bigger than so many of the the trevallies that I caught over there, and people aren't that excited about them. And that's, I, I think they're they're tremendously underrated. And I, I wonder, and I wonder if people could comment in the bottom of your podcast to see if it's a good idea or not. But like, uh, the thought thought comes to my mind of changing that Jack Creval, which is an odd name anyway, Jack Creval mm-hmm. or Cravalli Jack, maybe changing that to Atlantic Trevally. Like, I wonder if someone like a guide was advertising, they could say, you know, I catch snook, I catch red drum, and I catch Trevally, as opposed to I yeah. catch snook, I catch red drum and, and Jack. Like, I think the guy from Nebraska might be like, oh, he catches Trevally? You know, I mean, it may may spike his interest for fishing yeah. more than saying Jack listed. So I'm, I'm curious what your what your listeners would say, if it's worth it or not, to change it from Jack Crevall or Crevally Jack to Atlantic Trevally. Well, you know, it worked it for is the a, Goliath grouper. I mean, <laughs> people didn't really celebrate them when they were Jewfish as much as they celebrate them as they are Goliath, Goliath groupers. And uh, it, it does seem to work. And and I would think that it wouldn't necessarily work for the first few years, but if it if it took hold and you had somebody like the, the IGFA or something, that's the new name for them, um, the Creval Jack or the um, uh, Atlantic Trevally. I don't know. Yeah, and I looked into it. So uh, uh, the American Fishing Society has a committee where they look at um, fish names and they have criteria, but it doesn't, it would certainly work. Like it doesn't like, you can't like have any offensive name or mm-hmm. can't be named after a person or there's certain lists, but I went well, to the criteria Jack and Crevel? it certainly could. Who's Jack Crevel? So, it, it, it could be argued that it's already named after a person. All you got to do is oh, go yeah, through a bunch, a, of, bunch of fo- old phone books and see if there's somebody named oh, Jack gotcha. Cravel. That's what I, uh, <laughs> when I used to call my clients that were big-time lawyers or whatever, I would call them in, in the middle of their work day, and their receptionist would say, who may I say is calling? And I would say, this is Jack Cravel from Jack Cravel and Associates. <laughs> and, they, and she'd say, okay, hang on one second, Mr. Cravel. <laughs> Gotcha, gotcha. Oh, I'll have to use that one. But the um, but and then also I brought up on my slide here the um, just to show the similarities between the Jack Creval and the Giant Trevally. So they are somewhat similar, although obviously the Giant Trevally is thicker and it's got a meaner head. But they, I mean, you know, Baron, I do, but I feel like they feed the same, right? They're extremely aggressive and and they're such a both Jack Creval. I never fish for Giant Trevally, but I love Jack Creval because I feel like if you put it in front of them and move it, they're going to hit it. Yeah, right? that's that like, may be the difference. Is that um. You know, kind of like the difference between a Jack Crevel and a permit or something, where you, if if you put it in front of a Jack Crevel, and and move it, they're gonna eat it. If you, you know, you the permit is pretty spooky, and there are certainly situations where the giant trevally situations that I've seen, and I'm no expert on them, but I have fished for them a number of times. There are situations where uh, they can be incredibly spooky. Very, very, very spooky, which I think gives them oh, the, the game be, fish, sure. the the giant trevally. They can be they even though they're the oh, biggest well. thing on the flat and there's nothing bothering them, they can be they can be very spooky and hard to hard to get a fly in front of or a lure in front of. Now there can be another situation where they are the most aggressive fish you've ever seen, and I think there's this one video where that dude throws a flip flop out there. And it just gets crushed <laughs> by a, a giant trevally. So I think that that, you know, a lot of fish are, are kind of like that. Like if they're just too easy and they fight too hard, like the amberjack, the amberjack doesn't get a lot of um, a lot of respect either because it can be a very easy fish to catch. And it also fights so hard that people are like, uh, enough of that, you know, don't want another one yeah. of those. Um, but yeah, if they were yeah. a little more spooky – or if they were a little more difficult to catch, then maybe, you know, maybe that seems to be kind of where where people um, give it the respect, like a permit. You're not going to get tired of catching permit generally in the course of a day because they're pretty hard to catch. So if yeah, you, you catch one, one, that's a really big deal. Yeah, yeah. But if you go out and you catch 50 Jack Crevel, um, you can get tired of them. And also, a lot of times you have a fish like a Jack Crevel or a Barracuda that 
gets in the way of you catching something else. So you're trying to catch a permit and a Jack Carvel comes over there and, and grabs it. Or uh, you throw your fly out in front of a school, in front of a tarpon and a, and a barracuda snips it off or something like that. And so all of a sudden, you know, you're kind of mad at the fish. Like, but I don't know. I don't like, I don't like uh, the, the idea of a trash fish, like that one fish is necessarily better than another. I get it that if you're trying to do something with some sort of elaborate leader and a cuda comes and snips all your hooks off, that's a problem. And, 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 and it's kind of a pain. But on the other hand, barracudas can be some of the hardest fighting, most exciting game fish. If you're fishing for them in shallow water, they can be a yeah, really, yeah, really yeah. great time. Yeah. Um, but anyway, getting off, off the subject here about the, about the Jack and the, and the Trevally. I just want just to stress the point, you know, we have Trevally right here in Florida. We don't call them Trevally. We call them Jacks. And um, they're not all jacks, you know, just the Jack Cavall, the Black Jack, the Horse Eye Jack, the Yellow Jack, and the Blue Runner. So those are what I'm, what I'm talking about is the Trevally Jacks. And just that I think if we did call them Trevally, they'd get a lot more respect, you know, than, than what they currently have. And maybe it can help with marketing, too, you know, with the guides, you know, like, hey, come with me and fish, catch a Trevally. You yeah. know, it sounds more exotic than you caught a jack, you know, like a jack. That's kind of like people think, why not with up a catfish? Yes. But Trevally, well, you caught a Trevally? You know, he goes back home to Nebraska and, hey, yeah, I caught a big Trevally, you know. <laughs> they, also, so the, anyway. the taxidermist would be would be much happier. They would probably start mounting more of them. Gotcha, gotcha. So I think I'm gonna pursue it. I, I mean, I could, I, I'll see what your, what your, um, if there's some comments, you know, to your podcast. But yeah, it's great. I mean, you're never gonna get 100 percent agreement with anything. Yeah. But anyway, it'd be interesting if you most of your comments are like, yeah, it's a great idea. They should be changed to Atlantic Trevally or, or no. Most people are like, no, no, it's a horrible idea. But well, I don't I, know I, necessarily I about the it. about the changing the name. Maybe that yeah. maybe that does result in more more respect. But I, I just think that that the Jack Cravel is a is a wonderful fish it's a wonderful game fish and if you're a professional guide a jack crevel has saved the day more often than any other fish probably like you're just having trouble finding anything you can go to some place and tease up some jacks you can catch them on fly you can catch them on spin people that have never caught a saltwater fish it's going to do everything that a saltwater fish is supposed to do it's going to be an aggressive bite it's going to be a hard fight it's going to pull some drag and uh and you know it's got teeth Everything. It's just a really, really cool fish. Strong, fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although I never target them. I guess you have places where you target them. I feel like I've always run into them when I'm looking for something else, which is great. Yeah. But I've well, never really we focused have, it on. I'm gonna go get we absolutely have places and times that we um, – we target them, and it does seem to be a perfect fish for the for the guide because a lot of these times and places where we're targeting them are not really optimum for other fish. So, in other words, when you get like a a cold front that pushes in, and a lot of the permit bonefish and tarpon kind of are hard to find on those days. Those are days where you can go to a channel, and what we would do is. Um, uh, like if I had fly fishermen, I throw a hookless plug out into a channel and they come rushing up there after that. And you can, you know, do kind of a bait and switch and pull the lure out and throw the fly in and you can catch them on fly oh, that you. way. Or you can just kind of be, uh, you know, moving some jigs through a, through a deeper channel and, um, and, and you can catch them and catch lots and lots and lots of them. Um, but it's like it's the hookers plug. You'll know. It's like, are they there? You'll know, yes. right? If they and, come up, you know, some days yeah. they're more aggressive than others, and and some days, especially with the new stuff that we have now, we have this this Lawrence Active Target thing that um, it's like a, a sonar beam that you can you can aim in any direction and you can see it, like the difference between a, so cool. a, a a still image and a video image, so you can actually see the fish swimming through, and you can see schools of things out there. And if you know, okay, I'm in a channel where there should be some jacks here, and you see a school of, uh, you know, a bunch of different dots out there, and sometimes you can even see the the fork tails on a, on something like a tarpon or a really? permit, you can really see the fork tails, and you can see you can see absolutely that is a tarpon that you're looking at. I mean, not like, you know, this arc like the the arcs that we used to have. You yeah, would think, yeah, banana, well, whatever. Look, yeah, you'd yeah, be yeah. like, well, that's something. And it's likely a tarpon because we catch tarpon here all the time, but it could be a shark. It could be something else that's kind of resembling the size of what you're looking for. But when you see this new, the new technology, 
you can see fork tails. You can see the shape of fish if the beam hits them just right. Now, sometimes it just kind of looks like something swimming through there and you can't really tell. But when the beam hits them just right, it gives you an image of that fish. And you can say with pretty give good... You size too? Like yeah. You can be like, oh, that's a big one or that's a small one. You can kind well, of reference the size. Yes, you could certainly see that between a tarpon and a jack. Like if, if they were swimming through the same screen, you could see one is big and one is small. Um, but if you got into a place where you were you were pretty sure that there should be a couple of schools of jacks in there and you see maybe there's also a school of mullet and you could see the mullet were a bunch of smaller dots and then the jacks were a bunch of bigger dots and then the tarpon you could actually see. So, yes, you could be able to discern. Now, if you were just kind of coming across something and you had no idea what you were looking for and you see a school of fish out there, that could be permit, it could be jacks, it could be whatever. You might have to catch one to kind of uh, yeah, see yeah, what yeah, exactly yeah. it is. But this new technology is amazing. And so if you, um, you, know, you throw your hookless lure out there and they don't chase it, I'll kind of follow up with a with a jig, especially if it's a day where you know the weather's not very good. Some days that makes them really want to bite really well. Um, but the thing that a Jack Cravel loves more than anything else is a bucktail jig, and they just can't refuse that thing, especially if it's got a little piece of shrimp on it. I mean, that's okay. Okay, that's a great great lure for. You just for bounce jacks. it. Bum, 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 well, I don't bounce it on the bottom. I just kind of move it, kind of just. Pulse it through the through the water at different depths, and um, you know if they're not super aggressive, they don't really want to come up to the surface. I mean, they will, but maybe on some days they're a little more reluctant to come to the surface than others. And that's a day where it's just not really, you know, nothing nothing's really happening. You know, you either had a big big temperature drop or something's going on that doesn't have them feeling at their best. And but you can catch them on jigs. And you can move that jig much slower. The The surface lure is a fast thing. So, like, they're on, and they're chasing it, and they're eating it, and they're flipping out of the water. And that's that's pretty awesome when that happens. We did a crazy show on Jack Cravel in front of the Long Key Bridge um, last year. And uh, they, just, they just wouldn't stop coming. And there were more there than any other time I've ever seen that bridge. It was just a live with Ballyhoo and uh, Mullet and Jack Cravel, just it was like carnage. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I love that though, and I I just love the Jack Cravel. I think that there are like they're everything that a saltwater fish should be, in my opinion. They're just hard fighting, aggressive teeth. They're eating, you know, pretty much everything. But I mean, you can catch them on a crab if if you uh, move it fast, but they typically don't like crabs. So if you see a group of, sometimes you'll see a group of uh, jacks and there'll be some permit mixed in. And if you throw that crab in there, it'll just kind of sink and the permit will pick it up and the jacks won't. And so that's a, I think that's awesome because if you were to throw a a bucktail in there and, you know, the the jack's going to get it before the permit ever has any chance of maybe yeah, yeah, even yeah. seeing it, yeah. like they're gonna get it so fast. But the jack, you know, the jack will eat the shrimp, but they don't seem to like the crabs that much, even though they have crushers in their throat. Gotcha, um, gotcha. But I love those cool. fish. Well, thanks. I don't think you, something that you need to go out and catch some <laughs> trevally. Like, yeah, I know. Florida. I know. Tell me about um, what do you know about the difference between the the jack crevel and the horse hijack? The horse side definitely has the bigger the bigger eye. Mm-hmm. And it definitely doesn't reach the same size. In fact, I did look that up too. Let me tell I'll tell you real quick. The um the horse side like the it does get pretty big though. The horse side jack, uh the IGFA record is 32 pounds, but the Jack Cravel is 66. And the horse side jack seems like it's more wide ranging too. It goes all from Texas all the way to North Carolina. Um, which you can still get jacks, but it is pretty no, I'm sorry, the Jack Cravel in those areas as well. It looks like it's got a little bit of a wider, longer range. They seem to but be I'm not, bigger in the Bahamas for whatever reason. Oh yeah, I have I have heard that. I have heard that. I don't know if there's certain like a certain niche there they occupy. Like I've heard of like um um off Venezuela and stuff like that. And then some islands in the Bahamas they get some big horse hijacks. Mm-hmm. I've only caught small ones in the Keys. Yeah, they're they're typically like, pretty small. 
and it's like fishing for bait. I'm like, oh, I caught a horse side jack. Like I didn't even know. I thought I caught a blue runner than mm-hmm. a horse side jack. They they but, get um, um the, I don't know why, but most fish, and I think we talked about this before, and I'd love to hear your your theory on this of why this might be the case. But I always kind of maintain that you're going to find the largest uh, fish in the northernmost portion of their range. Right, so I don't know as a scientist if that makes any sense or if that's just kind of like bro yeah. science from my point of view. The biggest bonefish I've caught are at the northern portion of the range rather than the southern portion. It seems like as you go south, they get more plentiful, but they're also smaller. And so yeah. the bonefish yeah, 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 is a yeah, good yeah, example. Yeah. The uh, redfish is another good example where you look at like the outer banks and the the fish that those guys yeah, catch yeah. up there are really big. The cobia is another one where it seems like the further north you go, the bigger they get. Um, but the horse eye jack is one that has, has been kind of the opposite in my, in my, uh, experience that the further South you go, I caught some really big horse eye jacks in the Cayman Islands. Um, also caught horse eye jacks in the Bahamas that were bigger. And just my experience in the Keys is kind of like yours. They are kind of smaller and maybe I just don't know where to, where to get them or, or, uh, we just don't interact with one another like like we should but it d- they do seem smaller and they do catch a lot of yeah, small yeah, ones yeah, there yeah, yeah, yeah. why do you think that but would be that not... they would be bigger in the southern portions well the scientific basis so there's a book this guy famous fisheries biologist daniel Pauly, wrote a book on on growth of fish and the two most significant factors so first of all i guess forget about people have always asked me what about deer and terrestrial like i, I don't know about terrestrial animals don't <laughs> i'm not going down that road but anyway this guy wrote this book daniel Pauly, about the growth of fish the two most significant factors our diet and latitude. So meaning, so diet, you know, uh, when fish um, eat, actually when you eat fish, you, you get more calorie input than if you eat crabs. So I guess crabs, you spend a lot of energy breaking up the shell and the crustacean shell, all that stuff. But the, so when you eat fish, you tend, you're on the average, you're, you're bigger. But the latitude is interesting because he, he breaks it down like the further north you get. So oxygen is related to, the, the oxygen content in the water is related to the, um, the temperature of the water. So the further you go north, the higher the oxygen content. Hmm. So it breaks it down in the physiology. So it's like those northern fish don't have to spend as much energy extracting oxygen from the water from their gills as the southern fish do. So meaning as, a, as you get to the northern end of that range there, they can spend more time absorbing oxygen, put more energy towards growth instead of less energy if you're down south, less energy extracting oxygen and, and using it for growth. But you talk about the um, the horse hijack being bigger. I would think if it's just a, a diet factor, maybe there's another niche. Like I don't know why. Um, it seems like um, like the jack caval seems to be the or or the yellow jack on the reefs, right? Um, in terms of those trevally type jacks in the reef, maybe more dominant. But yeah, I have heard in some areas that there's some, maybe some type of niche. I'm not I'm not thinking of why those horse hijack are occupying those areas more dominant and bigger. Maybe their diet, maybe there's some type of niche that they out, can slightly outcompete the other jacks from being in those Bahamian islands. So I don't know exactly why, but um, but it is interesting that I have heard that the horse-eyed jack is, is bigger in some areas in the Bahamas, certain islands and so mm-hmm. forth. Now, another, so another thing that I notice is that in those particular areas, we're not seeing a lot of jack cravel. Like in the Florida Keys, we see a lot of jack cravel. They're at the jack-crevel. docks. They're, yeah, they're yeah, all over yeah. the place. You see them a lot yeah. and so the horse eyes are much smaller and and less plentiful and maybe it's because the the bigger cousin is more aggressive and just doesn't allow them to get a foothold there um but they're they they do slightly different things i guess the two fish do and maybe those bahamian islands maybe jack creval has never really got established there are you seeing any jack creval when you go to those places some those horse eye jack? some but a lot of times some. you see a jack and you catch it and you you're like, oh, that's a horse eye jack, you know, because you can, you can, you know, see with the eye, but also on the, um, on the scoots, they're, they're darker color, kind of like the picture of the blackjack that you showed. Now, that's a mm-hmm. fish that I don't think that I've caught, a blackjack, even I though we have them in the Florida either. Keys. I don't think that I've ever caught one of those unless maybe I caught a blackjack and mistaked it for a horse eye jack, but I don't think that, that I would because the horse eye, the horse eye looks so much like a Jack Cravel. Uh, with a slightly different eye and a slightly, slightly different shape, but kind of the same, the same body type. 
just a little shorter yeah, yeah. and a little wide, yeah, a little yeah, taller, yeah. and then it has those black scoots or at least color along the, the scoots. That blackjack that you showed had real dark scoots. Um, and I've only seen them. But I've seen, seen those. I did a reef fish survey years ago throughout the Florida Keys, and the only place I saw personally blackjack was in the Joy Tortugas huh. out there. So I don't know oh. if some of the people have seen them in the Key, but that's the only place. And that's where I, I also saw more horse eye jack, too, was also in the Joy Tortugas. Hmm. I know they're in other areas, but anyway. But, but yeah, the blackjack just must have a small niche it occupies in Florida or – I don't know why they're so, um, but maybe there are some Bahamian islands where they're more common than others. And there's got to be a reason, whether it's diet or, or a larval period, or they just establish a population there, out competing other fish from that area. But, but they are there is um, like some difference. So there. let me ask you a question about the the jacks family. Like you said, there are 96 species of jacks. Different species of jacks, yeah. Is from that the, from the amberjack to the jack of Albany, yeah, Right. Sorry. So there's obvious. That's obviously a large family is that the largest family of fish are there, no, is there another species more. that has yeah. has more what would it be that has more like cichlids cichlids oh. have like i mean cichlids range from like like peacock bass is a cichlid yes right and to to i mean you which kind of blows my mind like what is a cichlid you know um but i would i don't know what off the top of my head but i know there's definitely ones with more and cichlids seem to have like so many different species of fish it, it's i wonder about saltwater fish so. though if there's which, if which there's species? one that has more than, sorry, than sorry, the which, jack, which now snapper would have a lot of species, I would imagine, but I don't know more than ninety six. Ninety six around the, the whole globe, right? So around the whole world. So yeah, I don't know how many like um, if there's other like how many snapper there are in the Pacific and stuff, but but also I'm wondering, you know, is that we're not thinking about bait fish. There could be some small, which has a whole bunch of little species. But it does seem like a lot. I see what you're saying, Tom. Salt water wise, 96 species worldwide. But there's got to be some. I wonder if there's some other tropical species I'm not thinking of, like like parrotfish or something that just has a ton of different species. So, but it does seem like a lot. Yeah, it does and seem we're, like we're, a lot. And I'm then glad when, there are that many. <laughs> when, I, know, I know because I mean, you end up <laughs> coming across them and catching them, whether it's bycatch or, or targeted. Um, yeah, the jack or bait fish like the scatter, you yeah, know, common exactly. bait Blue fish, the goggle and, eye, and, yeah. yeah, goggle yeah. eye. That's a that's a jack too. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I wonder if there's another species of of or another family of fish that would have as wide uh, a diet as the as the jack, because you know when you're looking at like permit, I mean they do eat eat some fish and stuff, but primarily. Um, I would think that they're primarily shrimp and crab eaters uh, and, and shellfish. Like you see a lot of um, like uh, kind of clam looking things if, in their stomachs mm-hmm. if you ever open one up um, mm-hmm. and snails and other things like that. Uh, kind of a grazer, it seems like, where the Jack Crevel obviously has a different mouth structure and a different jaw structure and different teeth mm-hmm. and crushers in their throat with kind of teeth on them. Um, Definitely, when you look at the two fish, one is designed to to kill like other fish, and then the other is <laughs> is kind of designed as a as kind of a grazer, you know, a little bit of a little bit yeah, yeah, more fish. Di- yeah, Even though more I know diverse, that a lot of people strategy. tell me that they they caught their first permit while they were trolling a ballyhoo. Um, uh, yeah, really? Yeah, I've I've I know a lot of people that did that. In fact. I was just talking to Richard Black. Um, we, we did a show with him the other day, and he was saying that he um, one of the craziest things he's ever seen is he got to this area, and it was covered in ballyhoo, most ballyhoo he's ever seen. And the he, he kind of saw a big explosion off to the side, and he was like, oh, that's a cuda or a jack or something like that. And he looks over, and there's a permit sitting there. And he's like, that's weird. That permit probably just sat there while the jack – exploded next to him and then he sees it again and again and again and then he sees that the permit are like standing on their heads with their tails kind of out of the out of the water and then they would kick and explode on these ballyhoo and they were eating ballyhoo and he was watching it over and over and over again and then uh, my friend Kenny Harris was telling me that he used to um, troll ballyhoo and he'd catch permit like that a lot 
So they you're will. telling me I should be throwing a ballyhoo fly all these years. I should be throwing a ballyhoo fly, or, or, or dragging a big rubber <laughs> ballyhoo behind your boat, or or uh, throwing a ballyhoo at them. No, I, obviously, in, crab flies. <laughs> yeah, obviously, in some situations, it's going to be horribly unproductive. But it is interesting just to you know for any fish like. Uh, you know, to see them feeding heavily on something that you don't normally see them feeding on, that's uh, that's that's interesting, and 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 it's not the first time that I've heard permit eating ballyhoo um, or other fish. They they will go after other fish. Um, I mean, as anglers, you know, we catch the the majority of them on fly that looks like a shrimp or a crab, or actually yeah, yeah, on yeah. Yeah. jigs tipped with shrimp or um, a you know, a bonefish shrimp that you throw over there, or obviously the crab. That's that's what most people fish for them with. And they, I guess at some point they're opportunistic, right? It's like I like like I eat the crabs, but if I'm a permit, but I'm not going to turn out you know a, a, oh, an easy yeah. meal. If right you're in, front in of the me, right? largest school of ballyhoo that, that Richard Black has ever seen, that's obviously going to be probably the largest school of ballyhoo that that permit's ever seen too. Why not eat some of these? You know, and yeah, yeah, but yeah, but yeah. it's just interesting with their mouth structure that they don't. They're they're not really designed to do that like their mouth is all smooth inside and there's no yeah, teeth yeah, and everything yeah. i would imagine yeah, that yeah, they could take yeah. quite a few swipes at a ballyhoo before they before they really get one where the jack cravel's got something to hold on to you know he's, he's yeah. got some teeth because this i have seen go back in my diving days in the keys there were a few occasions where i was going out to the reef crest and i actually saw a permit tailing like what does he do you know it's like in 30 feet of water like why <laughs> is there a permit tail Seeing that, or maybe he was stalking Ballyhoo or something. Yes, but it was an odd experience. That's crazy. I want to show you this uh, this video that we just got, and I'm going to have to do it uh, just on the uh, just on the screen. Can you see that at all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is that? A whale? It looks like a what whale. What is that? A, but it's a manatee. It's oh, it's, it's a manatee. Can you see what's going on there? Are they mating? Yep. I think, oh. or they're wrestling or yeah, something. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what we saw. In, in 20 feet of water, we came across this, and we counted. At first, it looked like seven, seven manatee. And uh -huh. then as we st stuck around there, we, we ended up counting nine. And there were nine <laughs> manatee. And um, just wondering what you think about that. That behavior, obviously some sort of spawning behavior. Um, have you ever seen anything like that with manatee before? I have, right at um, Stiltsville out off Miami. And it's funny because I've never seen manatees so active in my life. Mm -hmm. Like I always think of them as slow moving, but when they're mating, they're aggressive, they're splashing, they're fast. Well, fast for their size, but... Right. But uh, yeah, it's a whole different animal. <laughs> yeah, that's what we were, <laughs> what that's what we were noticing. And that was like, they were like holding, can you see that? They were they yeah. were holding uh, this one female down, and uh, you know we got up close to them, but they didn't care that we were there at all. And yeah. the funny thing was yeah, is yeah. that I've never seen a manatee in this location ever. Not not a single, not any number. And here are nine of them so rolling shore. around yeah. on the on the surface and and just you know obviously spawning behavior. Um, just wondering though, like what what your thoughts are, why would they be doing it in that? Well, it wasn't very far offshore. It was just in Boca Grand Channel between Boca Grand Key okay. and the Marquesas, okay. but the water's 20 feet deep there. There's a lot of current in there. It's not a place that I've ever seen a manatee before. And, uh, you know, the people that we're with, uh, Brandon Sear, his brother Jared, we none of us have ever seen that before. And uh, yeah. just very strange. Yeah, I've seen it off of Stiltsville, and I also saw it back by Shell Key years ago. Mm. Or I'm sorry, yeah, you're back behind, back behind. Or I was over somewhere in downtown Amarada years ago. So, but it, it, I'm surprised they were that far, kind of on, on the current. I've always seen them like close to flats, but it sounds like you guys were more in 20 feet of water. Yeah, this that, was but, this was. I mean, maybe it started on a flat. That, and I guess that trying to keep it, uh, uh, you know. Kind of, Good for kids here, but I guess that drive to spawn is pretty. You know, I'm trying to be not to use any bad words here, but I guess that drive to spawn is pretty pretty strong with those male. You know, they're all fighting for that female. I would think so, so. and I would. That's what I was thinking that I was seeing there it was one female and eight males, like just kind of hanging hanging out waiting. But I don't know how and they're, they're all competing. I don't and know quite how to tell and... what what 
you know how how you tell a male manatee from a from a female manatee. But the reason that I that I brought that up is because I wanted to ask you um, from a scientific point of view, and it's fine if you don't know this or or if you do, um, but at least you could kind of give us a an idea. Over the last, I'd say, ten years, um, there have been a lot of videos, including some of my own videos, from manatees in marinas that are hanging around the fish cleaning table and get a hold of uh of a fish carcass and just start really? chewing it up and especially like a swordfish skin or something like that I first the first time i ever saw it was at murray marine and uh you know we're cleaning a bunch of snappers throw in some snapper skin and the manatee goes right over there and grabs it and starts eating it and it goes in its mouth and out of its mouth and in its mouth and out of its mouth and I was, I was like, that is the strangest thing. Has anybody ever seen a manatee eat a fish like that? Well, I know that they, um, I know the so far, I don't know a whole lot about manatee, but I knew that I know that they can detect fresh water. So I think that might motivate them to go in those marinas. Like they're looking for mm-hmm. that fresh water to drink. Like if you put a hose in, they literally put their mouth on it like a straw. Yes. A yeah. freshwater hose and put it in. Yeah. So I wonder if that's what's first, you know, bringing them over there. Well, but maybe. I'm surprised that they're doing, you know, as something eats seagrass. I'm surprised that once they're there, that they're actually eating the, um, eating the fish carcass. They're 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 but I guess absolutely they're re- eating it, and <laughs> it's not just. I I, I took Turn a video first. a long time ago. It's on my Instagram somewhere, of a manatee eating a carcass at Murray Marine in Key West, and then um, Nick Stanzik, who is at Bud and Mary's. And catches a ton of swordfish, and he's throwing a lot of stuff in the water right there. And there are a lot of manatee up there, more than more than in Key West. And he has had several videos on his uh, Instagram account of the manatee eating a fish skin. And just wondering <laughs> if you have heard anything about that, or if you knew anything, or if that's any sort of behavior that is normal, or is this learned behavior? Or what What do you think about that? I think it's odd. I don't know much about manatee, but I think it's really odd. And, uh, you know, uh, animal that eats seagrass and now it's eating, you know, because its teeth are designed for eating seagrass. Its digestive system is designed for eating seagrass. And now it's eating, you know, meat. Yeah. So I could certainly connect you with a manatee biologist, but that seems really odd to me that it would. Um, well, I'd like to, I, I would like to ask that question to the manatee biologist of what's going on, because yeah. maybe it's something that might be somewhat rare in nature to ever see them do it but maybe they if they came across something dead they might they might eat it um there have been some other videos lately um about deer eating birds and they uh <laughs> there have been several yeah and this is i'm just using this as an example i know you're you don't study deer but you know a lot of people think the same thing about deer that they only eat um grass and you know that's that's what they eat but there'll be lots of videos of a deer in someone's backyard and there'll be a baby bird on the ground and it'll just walk over there and eat it, pick it up and eat it. And it's very strange behavior, but maybe it's, maybe it's not, maybe it's only strange that we're seeing that behavior. You know what I'm saying? Like that's something that happens in nature, but we don't really see it very often so i can send you a video of this but it's been something that has been talked about on joe rogan a number of times and i just on just people that um that i follow i've seen people uh at certain times of the year they are taking a video of a deer in their backyard and it walks right over and eats a bird off the ground and (laughs) generally i think baby birds um that are just kind of fall that have fallen out of the nest, and I guess the deer is opportunistic. That okay, well, I'm eating that too. Um, <laughs> but they they have done that, and so the manatee exhibiting that behavior. I just wonder if that's natural or learned or something that we should be worried about, or you know, like what? Like is yeah, just... is that something that you know they're doing that because they're lacking something else in their diet or or maybe they do it all the time, and you just don't see them do it very often. Yeah, yeah, no, good question. You're really stumping me because I don't. I, it's hard for me to. I guess I'm stuck in my own rigid biological mind. But uh, the thing of a um, a manatee eating a fish carcass, just like WTF, man. That's what comes to mind. Like the WTF. <laughs> I, I know. Like, really? Well, that's what came to all our minds as we were sitting there watching it the first time I ever saw it, and then you know since then. 
it just seems like seems like it's happening. But I'll I'll send I'm, you this video and then we'll yeah, use I'm gonna it. connect you to a I know a friend of a friend that's a um Manti biologist. I want to connect you and I want to I want you to do a podcast. I want you to ask them and I want to listen to it. I yeah, want to see what they say. Absolutely. I want to so, hear about that. So uh, I don't know, you want to surprise them with the question or hey, by the way, I have video of them <laughs> eating carcass or like, you know, they put them on the spot. Yeah, but that'll I, be the that'll be the the primary yeah, uh, like, that maybe they can tell me that never happens. That that's never happened. And I can show them like nine videos of where, where it's happening. Um that would be the best. The other question I wanted to ask you is you know, like um, in Isla Morada back in the day when we had the the really really good bone fishing in in Isla Morada before the before the cold front, and um, you would have kind of an imaginary line where the bone fishing was in Isla Morada, and as you went towards the Everglades, you would kind of encounter an area where you could see bonefish and redfish, and then you would move past that, and you would see primarily redfish. Uh, as you moved up towards the Everglades. And then over time, after that cold front, um, you know, kind of had its way with the with the bonefish there, there were not as many bonefish in Isla Mirada, it seemed. And it seemed like the redfish moved right into town, like Shell Key almost, and, and all of those areas where, you know, it used to be where you would not see any redfish, and then you were seeing redfish where you once were seeing bonefish. And I'm seeing something kind of like that happening in the lower keys with the permit and the bonefish. And we talked about this new bone fishing, how great it is in the lower keys, but at the same time, not seeing quite as many permit in certain areas as maybe we used to. And I'm just wondering um, what your opinion is about fish competing with one another and you know, if if something kind of knocks the the population of one f- species down a little bit, and there aren't as many there, does another species fill that void? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. In, in fact, with um, it was Kenny Knudsen. I talked to him years ago about talk, tell me back. I think in the seventies and stuff, they did hubba, catch hubba. more red drum in that area around Shell Key and all that. And then I have some historical trends of the bonefish population. It was much lower back then. They were caught in commercial nets with the mullet nets, and the fishing mortality rate was much higher back then. But I totally agree. Yeah, if, if, yeah I mean, there's, there's certain species that will outcompete in other species for an ecological niche. But if that species goes down, then another one will move in. So, like, if you do have a yeah, lack of bonefish, then the red drum could, could spread out more and take over that niche of those areas. And by, but what does more bonefish take it out, compete them and push them back? Mm-hmm. So I do see there's a lot of examples in the winter of, you know, as one goes down, another one moves in. And then if one comes back, it'll push the other out. So that could be the certainly be the case of the, the spreading of red drum. And then also hearing stories of Kenny catching red drum way back in the day off Shell Key and stuff like that, which is more of, a, I think, more of a bonefish area. But if one goes down, another one comes up. But they kind of, yeah, balance each other. Would you think that that would be um, logical to assume that if – if you know the the amount of bonefish in the in the lower keys goes up significantly, that another fish like the permit might go down a little bit. It could, yeah. They're competing for the same crabs, right? Same mm-hmm. shrimp, same crustaceans. So yeah, it certainly could be the case. Or or is it the opposite? Maybe the bonefish are more in like the the, the muddy bottom, and the permit niche is more the the rocky area. So then it might be fine, but if they are, yeah, overlapping, if the, the bonefish could push them out and now compete them, hmm. you know, so. Yeah, well, that's, it certainly, certainly seems like that could be the case, maybe a little you bit. You less or, and less permit? W- w- just, just recently, right? Like just, just, yeah, there's a few, there's, there's less permit. Um, I think it's, I think it could be said fairly matter of factly that there's, there's fewer permit, but. Nobody's complaining because there's, the bonefish is fantastic. Bonefish. But yeah. when you really yeah. start to think about it, it's like, well, th- at one point in a lot of these areas, there were not very many bonefish, and there were tons of permit. It was the best permit fishing in the entire world. And but you know, everybody's wondering, scratching their head, why don't we see more bonefish? And you know, I think with with some of the work that that bonefish tarpon trust has done we've we've learned and you would know a lot more about this than than i do but i think we've learned that things that are happening far away from the florida keys like netting in mexico or cuba can have a big impact on our numbers of fish 
in certain areas. And those, you know, it, it's not that the fish are moving in from Mexico. It's that maybe the spawn is moving in. The fertilized eggs are yeah, moving yeah. in and getting If and they getting have a long larval span, yeah. If they're right. in that, that pelagic environment as a larvae for a long time, then you're right. It comes from farther and farther areas. So, yeah, it's de- definitely have an, have an impact. Re- impact the recruitment to the, the keys. Mm-hmm. So, but, you know, permit, we uh, we did a study years ago where we actually, um, a big chunk of the permit in the keys comes from the dry tortugas. Mm. So the way we did that was we actually found them spawning. We found out what date and what time. And then we also, we we caught some some baby permit up off Miami and other areas and found how many days old they are and kind of matched it. And then we actually did some forecasting model, meaning, okay, if they're spawning at this time to dry tortugas, then we know that their larvae will be carried to this beach at this time. And then we sampled there. Hmm. And we found them there, but really? you can't just see sample there year round. So, so it was interesting to see like, okay, we made a prediction, like it'll be on Key Biscayne on, and during this month is when we'll see the, the, the little like two week, three week, four week old permit. And we sampled there, although Key Biscayne, we sampled year round to make sure that we weren't missing any peaks and it really, it matched up really well. And so, so anyway, the, 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 what you were finding out was that the permit that were being, uh, produced in the dry tortugas, we're making it all the way to Biscayne Bay. Yep. Wow. Yep. And keep Biscayne. Yeah, yeah. We are, and then you can you can get those little baby permit, mm-hmm. and then you can back calculate their age. Okay, when was their birth date? Oh, it was whatever it was June, whatever. It matches up well with when we we're seeing observations, and also matches up well with our our modeling forecast, oceanographic models. If you see if they spawn here, then the current's going to take them over here. And at, at this number of days, they'll be here. Then you sample that spot. So, and I think, and both fish sharp trust is pursuing that. I don't think they've validated it yet, but like, meaning once you know the larval span, you can then look at, okay, if we know they're spawning here, we know their larval span, they can do an oceanographic forecast and then go sample there with nets and whatever and see if they're actually, see if it's true. Hmm. I think that's the next step to see like, okay, are you actually getting little baby bonefish? And then, then you can t- take a look at their otolus and back calculate their birth date. And so hopefully everything matches up and you have a, and permit, it worked out great. We had a great picture of, okay, we sampled them up and everything matches up. The birth date matches up with one we're seeing spawning and the, they're showing up in this area. We expected them to spawn up based on our oceanographic model. So mm-hmm. permit worked out great. Per, per, both of us have a longer larval span, so I think it's much more, it's a little more complicated trying to figure out where they're going and the currents can you know, vary a little bit here and there and stuff like that. So it should be, it's interesting work they're working on. So stay, the permit worked out well. I think both of us are still working on. Yeah, well, um, it, it is interesting though how you know you you, you look at okay well why is a, a fishery going down and you start to look at well what are we doing to hurt this or damage this fishery or or whatever when in a lot of cases it's happening well away from wherever we are right like we may be doing plenty of things that could be um, you know it could be a theory like well I think it's you know the the uh, pollution in the water. Or I think it's, you know, the, the prescription drugs in the water, or I think it's going to be this yeah. or this yeah, or yeah, this. Yeah. When in fact, the fish are just getting netted like crazy, you know, thousands of miles away. And that could be, I mean, it's almost like, you know, Occam's razor, like what's the simplest possible solution to this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is, are, is somewhere, is, is there somewhere within a couple thousand miles where they're just netting the crap out of bonefish? Or is it something that we're doing right here? And maybe it's a combination of both. In, in, in lots of situations, I'm sure it's a combination of both. But um, when you look at it like that, it's like, okay, yeah, that seems to make a lot of sense. Like if they're netting a ton of bonefish where they spawn, and then the currents would kind of line up with what we would think what might happen to, those, to, to that larva, then maybe that makes a lot of sense. But our point, and I might take some heat from this, but it's like I, I think of myself like in fishing, we're we're guilty too. We play a role in this, meaning there is fishing mortality. Sure. Right. So I think you know, everyone thinks of like, what about the other person? But like, you know, you catch a bonefish and barracuda bites off its tail. That's fishing mortality. It would be alive, it wouldn't for you. And and I make the argument, I consider myself a conservationist. I'm not a preservationist. I'm not there to look at the fish. I'm there mm-hmm. to catch them, mm-hmm. right? And so are you, right? We're not there yes. to look at them. We're there to catch them. But you got to accept with catching those fish, 
there is mortality. Like some permit you catch are going to die. Some sure. bowfish you catch are going to die. You you take steps to avoid mortality, but but I'm just saying um, we're also you know guilty. There is fishing mortality. It's also a contributing factor to declining populations as for well. For sure, and I think so. that's why um, you know the fish handling improved fish handling techniques and and you know even even to the going to the extreme of of okay you know a tarpon doesn't need to be brought into a boat. Um, and a yeah. Goliath grouper yeah, yeah. doesn't need to be brought into a boat just for a picture, and especially why are we bringing them into a boat if we cannot keep them? You know, it's one thing if yeah. you yeah, bring yeah. in a snapper and you, you say, well, this could go in the cooler or this could go in back in the ocean. I'm going to choose to release it. Okay, great. Well, maybe you could make that determination before you lifted it into the boat. I don't know. But, yeah, yeah. you know, with, with fish that are 100% release you know, get one picture and then release the rest. And I think a lot of people are getting a lot better at um, not only just deciding we're, we're going to minimize handling here, but minimize handling to the point of not touching them at all, you know, and, and especially with, with a, a more fragile fish like a bonefish uh, in hot weather. That's yeah, good, yeah, yeah. Good, and uh, I, good practice. I really and give... I think that it's getting, getting a lot better. Yeah, I feel like I give credit to I think the Bonefish Tarpon Trust. Like I feel like if you if you post on Facebook, social media of you holding a bonefish, you you might get tarred and feathered. Like I feel like nowadays, which is I mean, you might get criticized. Like it's pretty much all, all these pictures you now they're in the water. You know, keep them wet. To keep them wet. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's great because the research has shown that you seriously increase mortality if the longer they're on the deck of the boat, the more likely they're going to die. Yeah. So I give them a lot of credit for that. I think it's great. Shane's words back in my day, people would put them on the deck, try to find a camera back when I was, I'm sorry, my day when back when I was in Miami, people would put them on the deck, try to find a camera, you know, and they're looking around and meanwhile, the fish is drying out, you know, so yes. it's, it's definitely gotten better. So I yeah, think people have, have, uh, you know, because of a lot of, um, of good research and science showing that, you know, their brain is dying. You know, it'd be like holding you underwater for yeah, after running a marathon. Yeah, right? you run a marathon, and then somebody's <laughs> going to hold you underwater while they look for a camera. Uh, yeah, you know, it, you could have some brain damage there, and uh, and that's not good. So the the methods and um, intention of releasing fish, I think, has gotten a lot better, especially in the case of tarpon, uh, Goliath grouper, and bonefish, particularly. Um, it's gotten a lot better, I think, lately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, but I hear a lot of things about sharks are more prevalent now in the Keys. You see that now? Like, I hear oh that gosh. the shark mortality is a lot higher. Well, I so, don't know about the shark mortality. Uh, I'm sorry, the sharks eating bonefish, yes, you know, when you're bringing them in, the sharks are... Is 100%, no question about it. Everywhere, everywhere you go, inshore or offshore, there are more sharks than I've ever seen before and more sharks that, than any professional guide that I know. I don't know anyone that is out there on the water at all that would dispute that there are more sharks now and they're more aggressive than at any yeah. time in their career. And I do believe that it's an interesting thing because you will go up against some shark um, advocates that will argue and argue and argue that the population, the worldwide population of sharks is going down. And that could be, it could be very likely that the worldwide population of sharks is in decline, but not in the state of Florida. Not locally. Yeah. Not no, in our area. <laughs> not, but go up, keep going to Stewart and Jupiter and all that area. And those guys get chewed up, go across to the Bahamas. You can't fish for uh, yellowfin tuna. Um, you'll catch one and, the bite is on. You could catch as many yellowfin tuna. You could you hook as yeah. many yellowfin yeah. tuna as you want to, but you eventually you just Don't start feeding them. the fish or feeding the sharks, and that becomes this whole other um, debate of at what point do you leave and you know just just have to find someplace else to fish. And some guides are much better about it than others. You catch one or two fish. And you just know, well, that's all we're getting here, even though the bite is as good as we've ever seen it. But every one that we catch, we're, we're feeding the sharks. I, wa I watched it the other day. We were, we were filming offshore, and there was a guy boat right next to us. They must have hooked 30 fish, didn't land any of them. We hooked one, two fish, landed one of them, 
And the guy that we were with said, okay, well, that's all we're getting here. Like he just knew. That could really that put a dent on the populations, you know, like we, you know, otherwise you'd be letting them go, but now these fish are all dead. Right. So that really, they're, they're, they're all dead. And, and you just have to, you know, it, it, it lends itself to another argument or another debate or another discussion of what is ethical angling when you are just feeding fish to the sharks and how many do you need to do that to before you have to say, okay, well, we're going to have to find someplace else. And how many other places are there? And, you know, for a very experienced guide, okay, well, not only are we going to have to find something else, we're going to have to do something else. So now we're going to go sail fishing or we're going to do something where, you know, the, the sharks aren't going to chew us up like bottom fishing here. Every one that we're bringing up is getting eaten. Every tuna we're, we're getting is getting eaten. So at what point do you just have to say, okay, well, we're going to go do something else or we're going to go, you know, back, back in shore and fish for tarpon under the bridge or something like that. Um, but no question that there are more sharks. And I want to do some other podcasts about the shark um, population because it, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people think that it's way, way out of balance. Way too many predators, and there's never been this many predators. I tend to agree um, just from my own experience. Now, I do also believe that at the same time that we're having this overabundance of over aggressive sharks that obviously have learned that a fishing boat means food and they hear that coming and they come too. Um, yeah, I do believe that, that we could be in worldwide decline other places and, you know, but it's about the fishing regulations, right? They don't let them long line sharks like they, like they used to. And if the yeah, shark yeah. has zero predators, it, you know, it's a lot like a coyote or a lot like something else. It's, or, or those manatee that I showed you, it's, they're, they're going to mate and make other sharks. And eventually maybe there's too many. I don't know. It's a, it makes me wonder if that, all that shark defense stuff, does it work? Like you hear, I think you did podcasts on that, yeah. right? Like different items you can use to deter them. I've never really explored it, but I hope that stuff well, works. Well, there is, there is some of that going on and there's some stuff that, you know, apparently you can put it in the chum and it will bring in the fish but repel the sharks. I don't know. I mean, I think I, I think most people are willing to try about anything right now. It is dire yeah. dire situation because, you know, you, divers are going down and they're like, I, I used to see one shark here. Now there's 20. And, you know, how many... You know they're they're having to be incredibly careful about how to how they're spearfishing and and even not even going in certain areas, and uh, so in uh, you know a lot of people's opinion is that the Goliath grouper is way out of out of proportion and the sharks are way out of proportion and that you know there there was a step this year to to uh, open the Goliath grouper, Goliath. Yeah. Um, yeah. open it up and we'll see what happens. You know, that'll be interesting when we get the data. I did a, did an interesting podcast about that. And one of the things that was interesting about that podcast to me, or the most interesting thing was that, that they actually did open the, the season up for Goliath grouper and, and how difficult of a decision that was because, because it was an all release fish, there was very little data to, to draw from of how many there are out there. And so I really thought that that was quite a, a, a good move in, in the direction of showing the public that, well, we are keeping track of this and we would like to see a season open. We would like to see that happen for the people that want to catch a Goliath grouper and, and kill it and eat it. And, and if they want to get a permit, that's great. And we're going to open this up. It would have been very easy for them to say that we just have no data to know how many there are there. And then you get yeah. another hurricane yeah, yeah, or you yeah, get a red yeah. tide or you get this or that. And it's like, it would have been very easy for them to, to not open that season. So I, I think big kudos to all the powers that be that they did open it, even if it is for a trial, because it's going to give a lot of data to yeah. you know, what's, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. what's the demand on this. Is it worth $200? It, could we charge $2,000? I don't know. What is it? And where does that money go? And, and how does it benefit you know, the species as a whole, if you get more data on that species. 
Because you know, it's funny because we depend on that. You know, look at the catch rates, what are the size of fish, what are the numbers of catches. But if you close the fishery, we don't get that data. Right, exactly. So, right, you know, is there recruitment? I don't know. There's no catch data. So it actually, it's funny how you close a fishery, you close off a data stream. So, so it does help by opening up. We still have a better idea of what, what they're catching. Although I think they open up to small fish. But I do, I do think it's a good step. What's the start? You know, one step, open up this fishery, limited harvest. See how it goes. I'll get some data and also see what how it impacts the population. Yeah. So we well, there's somewhere. so many other situations where maybe it's an area closure, where you know they say, well, we're going to close this area for a, a certain amount of time, and we intend to reopen it. Twenty years later, it's still closed, and you know you're just kind of like, okay, well, I guess, I guess it's just easier to keep it closed than it is to open it for whatever open reason. So that's why I thought it was such a big deal about the Goliath grouper because it just seemed like there were a lot of reasons why not to do it, and they did it anyway. And and I think that's really good, you know. I I do personally, and maybe maybe that could be the same kind of thing for sharks. I don't know, or maybe maybe the lobby for killing sharks is just too strong, and that that's not going to be something that um, that happens. But I don't know. I mean, but if you're a guide in the Keys, as a you know, specialized in sharks, you can probably have some good trips out there, right? Oh man, <laughs> <laughs> it's as good as it's ever been. Plus, plus uh, the shark is very, um, very friendly like that. I mean, you can catch a shark that's got nine hooks in his mouth, and and so catch and release for sharks absolutely works. And you can even find your own hooks in there. You're like, okay, well that's my yeah. rig. And somebody else has been fishing this spot because that's not my rig. I know that I don't, I've never used that hook before. I, I don't use that knot. And you're seeing, you're seeing yeah. those, those yeah, rigs yeah. in their mouth too. So, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're not the only one fishing there. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. but it, but it does work. And, and, you know, people love sharks. Uh, they love to catch them. And, and a lot of the, you know, the real sport fishing guides, kind of poo-poo them, but when you get a tourist from, from somewhere, you say, well, uh, you know, what would you guys like to catch today? And they're like, I don't know. I don't know what's available. What what could we maybe do? Like, well, we could tarpon fish or permit or bonefish or, I don't know, maybe we could catch a shark. Shark! We could catch a shark? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's how it goes. Like, if there's any possibility that we could catch a shark, let's go do that. And it's like, okay, a challenging day all of a sudden turned into a very easy day. We're going to go out and catch sharks and these people are going to be happier than they would be if they caught, you know, they catch five tarpon and they're thinking, man, wouldn't it have been cool if we could have caught a shark? And yeah. Cause no one back North will know like, what's a tarpon? Yeah. Like, what is yeah, it? Is, yeah. They have zero, <laughs> zero, uh, desire. Uh, you know, they're, they're out there for a good experience, uh, in, in so many situations. Now, of course you have other people that are come for a specific, specific species at a specific time of the year on specific tackle and all that stuff. These aren't the people we're talking about. We're talking about the people that, you know, your, your tourist trips and on the tourist trips, they want action or they want a shark, you know? So Jack Cravels, getting back to the original thing, Jack Cravels and sharks. That is the ultimate, um, that's the ultimate trip for a, for somebody They'll make that you sweat. has never They'll done it you before. Yeah, yeah, you can <laughs> you, you you can hook anything on there and throw it out there and and they catch it. So the idea of this podcast when we first started was to to discuss the Jack Cravel and discuss whether discuss whether or not it would be beneficial to the reputation to change the name to Florida Trevally or Atlantic Trevally. Yeah. yeah, Florida Trevally or Atlantic Trevally. I'm thinking more Atlantic Trevally just to, so the people in North Carolina don't get, what about us, you know? So. Yeah, so the Atlantic Trevally. What about the Gulf of Mexico Trevally? It'll still be in Atlantic. Yeah, it's, you're right, it's found in the Gulf too. So um, maybe if you're, if you're in listeners of other ideas, but some type of Trevally. Florida Trevally may be too specific, but I was thinking you're right, a Gulf Trevally, but I think Atlantic yeah, I don't know. I, I haven't thought it through yet. Okay. But anyway, the main thing is change the name to Trevally. I got gotcha. you. So when you do that, uh, let us know, and we'll put out a petition for uh, for the name change. Uh, there has to be some some way to go through that. It happened with the Goliath grouper. It's happened with a few other fish. Um, there is. There's a whole process. I can apply and see if it goes through. And, and uh, What if it's Lark? Why don't you make it Larkin's Trevally? No, they don't let you use the names. And plus, that's I'm not that narcissistic. So. <laughs> so, all right, all right. Well, we're gonna hook up, and you're gonna get me some uh, some uh, somebody's name that we can talk to about these ravenous vamp- vampirous 
uh, manatees. <laughs> manatees. <laughs> that, yeah, don't that, swim near them. Stay away. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to swim in. Certainly not in the dark with the with the manatee. They seem to be taking over. They're more aggressive than ever. Well, I'd love to talk to somebody about the shark population too. So if you think of anybody that you can hook us up with, there would be a lot of questions, and that would be a very popular one on the on the sharks. But Mike, I appreciate you coming back today and talking about uh, the jacks and the the family of the jacks and the and the atlantic larkins trevally that that we're gonna have (laughs) you'll probably not want it but that's the way it'll go down in history Uh, but anyway man i hope you have a great day and uh thanks for all the good information let people know how they can find out anything more about you or follow you anywhere that you would like for them to yeah i just i just i'm a simple email person Iwopomorph at gmail.com. So it's like E-L-O-P-O-M-O-R-P-H. Iwopomorph at gmail.com. That's the simplest way to reach me. Okay. I'm not that social. So right. on social well, media. But you will return emails. So if you have a question yeah. for Mike, send him an email. He'll return it. And uh, as always, thank you, Mike. We'll, we'll do another one. And uh, I hope you have a great day. For all the rest of you, um, we'll see you next week. See you.